Welcome to the week seven video lecture of accounting for decision making. I'm really excited that this is your final week in the class and uh, I also want to congratulate you for pursuing diligent and dedicated efforts throughout the course. Um, I think this is going to be an exciting moment for you as uh, knowing that your, your business education is now more complete with knowledge of, of accounting focusing on on the aspects of accounting that you need to know in order for you to make managerial decision making. We conclude um, the accounting course with some common methods of analysis and I do see you uh, doing a lot of the, the methods that we're going to discuss uh, throughout the uh, week seven and you know also you know the uh, concepts that we're going to cover um, in the video lecture and some common methods of analysis are known as uh, vertical and horizontal analysis, financial ratio analysis, and then finally we will conclude the week with focusing on some concepts from sustainability and how that contributes to positive business endeavors. Now in the uh, financial statement analysis, when you look at horizontal analysis, you, you can only do horizontal analysis if you have a financial statement, meaning you have to have an income statement uh, or a balance sheet or a statement of retained earnings. You got to have one of those financial statements, but you have to have two years of financial information, meaning that you can have the statement with all the elements, but you need two columns, you know, one for the current year and one for the previous year. So let's say if we were analyzing a company, you know, some probably don't have their 2018 financials yet, but in the first column, you can have uh, 2017, and in the column next to that, you can have 2016. So what you're gonna be doing is, you're gonna be, um, you know, comparing, um, you know, the financial state, you know, two years of financial statements. So when you do horizontal analysis, you got to have a financial statement, you got to have two years of financial information, and then that's where you're going to go ahead and apply the tool of uh, horizontal analysis. Okay? And horizontal analysis is going to provide a year-to-year -year comparison of a company's performance in different periods. Um, so you're going to have, for example, uh, sales. And then you're going to have sales, let's say you have 10,000 in 2017 and you have 15,000 in 2016. What happened that sales are lower in 2017 than they were in uh, 2016. So you're going to have a, a negative 5,000, which means that sales went down from one year to, to the other. And, and this is where you have to apply your managerial decision making and you have to go you know, you have to dig deep to see, you know, what caused the decrease in sales. Was it an external factor or was it something internal um, regarding, you know, all the concepts that we talked about, you know, during week one through week six that we were focusing on the cost accounting methods and we were looking at direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, process costs, job costs. You know, you're going to have to focus if there's anything in that process, if there's too many parts to the process. If we're not optimizing operations and uh, you know are we not doing are we not if those are not the cases you know are we pursuing the right marketing strategies are we promoting our product effectively so the horizontal analysis can 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 give you indicators that can raise some flags for you to dig deep and analyze you know it's sort of like uh, you know if, if you do horizontal analysis like in the example that I gave you for sales you know, you look at that and then, you know, you get like an onion and you peel the first layer, you know, what, what was it? Let me look inside the operations. Um, let me look at product development. You know, you start looking at things, you start peeling layers off the onion. So then, then, you know, you can, you can do horizontal analysis to, to the expenses as well. You can do horizontal analysis to elements of the balance sheet, um, your current assets, your, your current liabilities, and you want to see, you know, whether they went up or down. Um, you want to see, uh, you may want to see individually which current assets went down, which current liabilities went down or went up, whatever the, the case is. So 
just remember horizontal analysis provides a year-to-year -year comparison of a company's performance in different periods. Then you have vertical analysis and that is a means of evaluating the relative size of each line item in the financial statements. Also helpful to compare companies of different sizes. So when you do vertical analysis, which what you're doing is, is that you, if you look at a balance sheet and, and a balance sheet, you, you know that it, it consists of assets, uh, it has liabilities that it has owner's equity and the accounting equation is, is in there, you know, so assets have to equal liabilities plus owner's equity or stockholders equity. So in the asset section, you have cash, you have accounts receivable, you have prepaid expenses, you have um, inventory, and then you have land buildings and so forth. They're listed in that order that I just gave them to you. They're listed in their order of liquidity. They're listed in the order that you can quickly convert them into cash. So what the vertical analysis does, it, it enables you to be able to determine, um, you know, as, as, as you're going to see in the literal definition of a vertical analysis, a means of evaluating the relative size of each line item. So if the first line item is cash, you know, what is the relative size of cash, you know, to assets, you know, what percentage of cash, you know, out of total assets. So. You know, is cash 10% of total assets? Is it 15%? Is it 50% of total assets? You know, so forth. So what is the relative size of each line item in the financial statements? Um, and you could do the same thing with accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is what percentage of total assets. Inventories is what percentage of total assets and so forth. You can do the same thing with liabilities. No payables is what percentage of total liabilities and so forth. Um, and you can do it with income statement item, you know, sales is what percentage of net income and so forth. And the ratio analysis also provides a means of evaluating the relationship between key components of the financial statements. Now ratio analysis, um, I will tell you that basically what, what is important for you to know uh, about the ratios is, is that there's, there's several categories. You have, for example, liquidity and liquidity ratios tell you how quickly you can convert assets to cash. And you have two types of liquidity ratios. One is one focuses on converting your cash mm -hmm. with the current assets and the other one focuses on, you know, what is your liquidity with your with your total assets. So one is called a, a current ratio, the other one is called a quick ratio. Okay? The quick ratio focuses more on the current assets. But what happens is you have a liquidity, a liquidity category, you have a profitability uh, category, and you have a solvency category. And you have about, you know, there, there's, there's probably about, you know, two to four important ratios under each category. Two for liquidity, you know, two to four for profitability, two to four for solvency. And, and you're going to, and all, all, all you do really with the ratio analysis is you, you have to know the formula. You know, like current ratio is your current assets divided by current liabilities, but you got to know where to get the information. Current assets over current liabilities, they're in the balance sheet. Okay. So if, if you know the formulas for the ratios, you can compute them as long as you know in which financial statement you're going to find where you get the numerator and where you get the denominator. Um, one, one aspect of ratio analysis that, uh, you know, most people find a little bit tricky is whenever you see the word average in the denominator, you know, what all average means is that you have to, you have to look at two years, the, you have to look at the financial inf information of two years. So if the denominator tells you average inventory, you know, whatever, if it tells you uh, accounts receivable divided by the average inventory, what it's telling you is that in the numerator, you're going to get the current year's accounts receivable, but in the denominator, you're going to add the, the current year's um, inventory plus the prior year's inventory, and you're going to divide by two. So you're only going to have one figure there, but in order for you to get that one figure, you got to add the financial information from two years and then divide by two, and that's how you're going to get it. Okay, so whenever you see the word average in a denominator of a formula, it's going to tell you to add it and to divide it by two. 
The other, the other aspect of, of financial statement and ratio analysis that I will share with you is that once you do financial statement analysis and once you do ratio analysis, you, you know, you're going to come up with numbers, you know, you do horizontal analysis, okay, you have an increase and a decrease and you got to dig deep and figure out, you know, why was it high, what was it low, is that a good thing, is that a bad thing? In the vertical analysis, you're going to see why, you know, you know, what percentage of each, you know, uh, line item uh, is, you know, belongs to assets and belongs to liabilities and belongs to stockholders equity, what percentage of sales makes up, you know, uh, you know, net income and things like that. So, so those results will help you dig in deeper into the organization and find ways that you can be more efficient and more effective. However, you know what you have to look at. You have to look at the, this analysis from from another perspective. Okay, you calculated a ratio and you got a number. So what? Okay. Um, and horizontal analysis, you subtracted one year from the other one and you got a number. So what? Okay. So you look at the numbers and they're going to be even more important and these tools are going to be even more powerful when you can get the numbers from your company on the on the horizontal analysis the vertical analysis the ratio analysis and you can compare it to a company similar to yours in the industry and see if if the numbers of that company and of course the company should be the same size and, and you know same size and scope you know as your company but if you compare them you know and and you're a lot lower in certain things and and that's not a good thing you know you may want to um do some research and find out what is it that company's doing that you're not doing that per, that for example they have a you know better figures in sales um better you know better figures in net income maybe they sell their inventory faster maybe they collect the accounts receivable quicker than you do i mean those are all measures that you want to see what is going on you know so it's going to be even more meaningful that you that you that you not only go in and dig deep within the company and find out what produced those results but that you actually compare your results to another company's uh results and see how you can um, acquire more market share um, in that industry so you could you can look at it from that perspective the other thing that you can do is compare your company to several of the companies that are similar to yours in the industry okay so you know like for example you know um, if JC Penney the department store looks at their you know they do financial statement analysis and ratio they get their numbers you know they look internally they they try to come up with solutions but if they look at jc penny versus Kohl's, you know and then then it, it becomes then the tool becomes even more powerful than using it internally because they can see what Kohl's is doing that jc penny is not doing if jc penny wants to take that a step further jc penny will compare their results with uh Kohl, not only with Kohl's, but they'll compare it with sears and with macy's and some other stores that are kind of in the same line as as jc penny so that's really i mean in the readings it's going to make more sense to you when you see examples in the book of of horizontal analysis of vertical analysis and ratio analysis um just just like some of the concepts in the previous weeks i do my best to explain them to you in the video lecture but you have to you have to um uh, absorb and process that explanation and then look at a visual of it in in the textbook illustrations but like for example if you if we look at an income statement um again you have 2017 as one as the current year and 2016 as the previous year and you look at sales revenue sales revenue in 2017 is 858,000 and sales revenue in 2016 is 803,000 well what has happened that between 2016 and 2017 uh, revenue went up it went from 803 to 858 so you know we're talking about you know easily you know $55,000 increase from 2016 to 2017 you look at the cost of goods sold you know you went from 509,000 to 513,000 so you know what it costed you to obtain the goods increase from one year to the other and then you can say well maybe the prices were higher there was inflation or whatever the point is but um, it, it kind of tells you how you're performing from one year to the next 
you can do the same thing with the balance sheet look at the cash look at the accounts receivable look at the inventories that they go up to they go down look at the current assets and so forth look at the liabilities look at the stockholders equity look at retained earnings and so forth so um, for horizontal analysis you know there's a two-step process you know the first step is compute the dollar amount of the change from the earlier period to the later period and step two is to divide the dollar amount of change by the earlier period the base period so I mean in step two if you were to do that you know if if you say if you look at the uh, sales revenue examples that it went up by 55,000 you know because it, it went from 803 to 858 803 in 2016 858 in 2017 you know the difference was 55,000 so what you're gonna do is you're gonna divide the 55,000 right how the formula says that you're gonna do that um, by the earlier period which is the base period so you get the 55,000 you divide by the 803,000 right and you get 6.8 percent that's how you calculate the percent change so the the horizontal analysis can just give you the increase you know it increased by fifty five thousand dollars but if you want to take that increase into a percentage you got to divide that increase by the base year which is the earlier year which was 2016 and that's where you get 6.8 percent and you can do the you can do the same thing with horizontal analysis of income statement information and and so forth Uh, vertical analysis, you know, you you remember that it's is you're getting you're getting a specific line item like cash. If you see there that cash is, um, if you see cash is twenty nine thousand dollars, and current assets it's two hundred and sixty two thousand. You're going to divide that twenty nine thousand into the two hundred and sixty two of current assets, and you're going to come up with a percentage. So it's approximately three point seven percent of current assets and so forth and if you want to divide it by total assets you'll probably get a lower percentage all right and then lastly you have the standard financial ratios and remember that financial ratios they measure the ability to pay current liabilities they measure the ability to sell inventory and collect receivables they measure the ability to pay long-term debt they measure profitability and they measure stock investments and analyzing those stock investments um, in order to pay current liabilities you're going to you're going to use the working capital the current ratio and the asset test ratio the working capital is simply subtracting current liabilities from current assets so current assets minus current liabilities give you working capital so for current assets for uh let's say we have a company called supermart and their current assets were 262,000 and their current liabilities were 142,000 the difference is their working capital 120,000 so there are ample current assets to meet current obligations with the current ratio it's current assets divided by current liabilities it measures the ability to pay current liabilities with current assets current ratio of 1.5 to 2.0 is generally strong so Supermart's current ratio for 2017 gives them a 1.85 and for 2016 gives them a 1.87 so they're between that 1.5 and that 2.0 which makes them generally strong the asset test ratio they it focuses on on specific current assets not all current assets but maybe the first three or the first mainly the first three which you have cash short-term investments plus net current receivables and then you divide that by the total current liabilities and um, it does not include prepaid expenses or inventory um, 0.9 to 1 is acceptable in most industries so asset test ratio for supermart is simply between uh, 0 0.93 and 1.01 .01. it's between that you know uh, that area of 0.9 to 0.1 now how do you measure the ability to sell inventory and collect receivables the inventory turnover the accounts receivable turnover and the days of sales and receivables okay so how quickly do you move the inventory how quickly do you collect from customers and on average how many days for inventory turnover you're going to see that the formula is cost of goods sold divided by average inventory so the cost of goods sold you're going to get from the income statement the average inventory you're going to get it from the balance sheet 
It measures the number of times per year company sells its average level of inventory. High turnover indicates ease of selling inventory. Low level indicates difficulty. Okay. The accounts receivable turnover is net credit sales. You get that from the income statement over the average net accounts receivable and measures the ability to collect cash from credit customers. A high ratio indicates faster cash collection. Days of the sales and receivables, you're gonna get one day sales, which are gonna be the net sales divided by 365 days. And you know, once, um, once you get that, you divide that by 365 days. Measuring the ability to pay long-term debt, you have the debt ratio and you have the times interest earned ratio. The debt ratio is total liabilities divided by total assets. That's gonna show a portion of assets financed with debt. A debt ratio of one indicates all of assets are financed with debt. Higher the debt ratio, higher the risk, okay? The times interest earned ratio is income from operations divided by interest expense. So you get your income divided by the interest expense to income statement items, and it relates income to interest expense. It's gonna measure the number of times operating income can cover interest expense. When you measure profitability, you get the gross profit percentage, uh, you get the operating income percentage, rate of return on net sales, rate of return on total assets, rate of return on common stockholders equity, and earnings per share of common stock to get the gross profit percentage, you're gonna get the gross profit and you're gonna divide by net sales. And your gross profit is gonna be your sales revenue minus your cost of goods sold. You get that, and all of that you get, you can apply this formula by going to the income statement and you can make the uh, calculations. And those are the main ones that you're gonna be needing. The rest are there and, and basically, as long as you know the formula and you know in which financial statements to pull the, the uh, financial information from, you can easily calculate the ratios. And this is a lot that with practice and, and with, with a lot of reason to do it, um, it's going to be really valuable for you to know how to use these tools to make um, wise managerial decisions. So we have, you know, the last thing that I, that I want to cover with you is, is the sustainability aspect. And sustainability, we're going to see how sustainability contributes to, you know, successful businesses as well. And um, we'll look at a high level overview of sustainability. And we will be concluding uh, the week seven video lecture with sustainability. And sustaini sustainability is the ability of a system to maintain its own viability, endure without giving way, or use res resources so they are not depleted or permanently damaged. So, so they, they want to make good use of their resources so they're not, you know, they don't go to waste. And sustainability also gives uh, companies the ability to operate in a manner that is able to continue indefinitely. And, um, and, and that's really what you want. You want to focus on the fact that, um, you know, that your business is sustainable, that you've got control measures in place to ensure that, that sustainability is taking place. There are three interrelated factors in sustainability. You can have sustainability in the center, and then there could be social, economic, and environmental factors that surround sustainability, that they can impact sustainability. Now, there's a triple bottom line concept that views a company's performance in terms of ability to generate economic profits and its impact on the planet on the, and on the people. So, so one thing is how society views the company as, as a profit mechanism and the other thing is how it's going to view the company and whether it's impacting the planet and the people. And usually if the impact is good, it's going to be viewed favorably, but it's, if it's having a an impact that is questionable or in some way negative, um, then it's not. And you know, the triple bottom line is the uh, the profit, the people, and the planet. Those are the three uh, bottom lines: profit, people, and planet. And a company must consider all three to be viable in the future. And in December 2015, there was a Paris Agreement within the United Nations, 
and it was a climate change conference known as the COP21. It limited global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and 175 countries signed on that. And considering both internal costs and external costs, you know, um, there were, you know, some uh, positive outcomes that came of that as far as to the, uh, um, you know, the compliance that organizations have to adhere to as far as those standards. Now, there's a life cycle assessment that consists of sourcing of raw materials, transport of raw materials, processing and production, distribution, use of the product by the consumer, and ultimate disposal of a product. So if we look at sustainability in, in the center, there are certain factors that revolve around sustainability that can have an impact. So sustainability, you know, how do reducing costs, you know, impact sustainability? How about reducing risks, creating new revenue, attracting labor talent, attracting capital, increasing market share, and improving the external image? Reducing cost, you focus on what is good for the environment. You know, um, focus on, ha on using LED lighting, hybrid vehicles, waste audits, reassessing material and packaging used, reassessing waste production. What about generating new revenue streams, sustain sustainable product innovation, um, recycling and repurposing, seeking new products to achieve low emission goals? Increased market share, consumers increasingly focused on social and environmental impacts. Do a supply chain assessment. Purchasing decisions are influenced by suppliers, social and environmental impacts. Community members and special interest groups also put pressure. So when you focus on improving the external image, remember com what community members can do. Um, you know, uh, research what occurs, you know, why do, why would, um, Communities go into boycotting and picketing. Um, publicity can be good or bad, which can either help or hurt business. And, you know, reducing compliance and litigation risks. You know, remember that regulatory compliance with uh, environmental regulations, fines or litigations for non-compliance exist. You have the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, it's a really good resource so you know what to do and what not to do as it relates to the environment and and you know 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 your um, know the business agencies that are you know for at, at the state and at the federal level so that you know who controls what and that and that your company um, abides by you know um, you know the what what these organizations uh, want you to adhere to you know, it's also a way of being socially responsible um, to the country, to the state that you're operating business in, and to the people that are ultimately going to be your consumers. And then again, you, you also want to be able to attract and retain labor talent. Your sustainable practices can improve employee morale in hiring. They can prevent turnover. They can lead to higher productivity. They can reduce absenteeism and uh, there can be more, more employee engagement and lower health care costs. And you definitely want to attract capital and you definitely want to have positive sustainability um, you know data that, that you know you're, you've been successful in efforts that you have engaged in to be a, a sustainable company. So that concludes our week seven concepts. And then I just want to review what you have to do in week seven so that you can be successful in, in the uh, final assignments that you have for the course. And you have your three discussion questions in week seven, just like you, you did in the previous weeks. So discussion question one for week seven, explain and discuss the three performance factors that should be considered of a company wishes to become more sustainable excellent you know you have that you have that covered and your discussion question number two explain why vertical horizontal and racial analysis are useful excellent you have the foundation for that and week week seven discussion question number three explain why a firm should focus on sustainability to create business value excellent i think you have that covered as well 
All right, excellent. So what you're going to do for your essay assignment is you're going to retrieve comparative balance sheets for Marriott Corporation, compute the following ratios for 2017 and 2016, or the most recent two years that Marriott may have available on their, on their website in their annual reports. So you're going to, you're going to calculate the uh, ratios for, you're going to do the current ratio the times interest earned ratio, the inventory turnover, the operating income percentage, return on common stockholders equity, earnings per share of common stock, and you're going to do the price earnings ratio. And then you're going to prepare a 1200 word essay where you synthesize the concept from this week's readings as you respond to the following. Explain what type of investment decisions would you make based on your computation results. So remember we talked about this earlier, you, 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 you compute a ratio, you do financial statement analysis, you get the results, and then you have to get those results and make them meaningful, whether you're doing it internally or you're comparing your company externally to other organizations. Discuss the opportunities and challenges you see with managerial accountants. And also briefly describe sustainability, its creation of business value, and some uses and challenges. I think you have discovered, I think you, you have, um, pursue diligent efforts and um, you know I'm, I'm really excited that you got you know this far in the class to the last week and uh, you're going to continue to do well uh, not only in this course but in the rest of your courses in in your MBA program thank you and good luck